Where are we sitting? 951%. Let's do this before I run out. G'day, friends. I've been trying to find a way to present this build so it's not like all of the other hey, I made a corset videos out there, and folks, that's not easy. There are plenty of process videos and how-to videos and why corsets aren't bad videos. Trying to find a new spin or angle is daunting. So I'm not going to try being different from anyone else on this. Consider this your calm and soothing smooth jazz break from all of the Bridgerton hot takes floating around right now because uh, there's, there's a lot of them. For Bridgerton, against Bridgerton, what Bridgerton got right or wrong, or should we just disengage our minds and enjoy the fantasy? I'm not actually throwing shade here. I don't claim to be an expert on film costuming, Regency fashion, or the interpretation of modern romance novels to new media vis-a-vis -vis Netflix. I'm not even an expert on what wine pairing goes best with costume movies. I just choose a funny name from a North American winery and try not to let the sock I'm and get too big as it evaporates from my glass. Uh, remember, red wine for winter, cool whites for summer, and rosé only if you must. Hats off to all you costumers cashing in on the algorithm. May you go viral and quit your day jobs. Confession, I, I haven't watched Bridgerton yet. I may have gained access to the stand and I'm too busy watching people die of plague. What? Too soon? Sorry. Now the observant among you and possibly the folks who found me via my Edwardian corset video are probably asking, do you really need a new corset? And the answer is maybe, kind of. If I'm justifying my new corset as part of my ongoing project Edwardian, in which I learn more about my heritage by exploring the things my ancestors wore, well, I'm pretty sure this family portrait dates to the mid-1890s. Great-great-grandmother Isabella and the girls seem to be rocking some massively poofy sleeves. And what research I've been able to cull out of contemporary delineator magazines published in Toronto, that would be somewhere between 1893 and 1895. It looks like that was the brief but notable time of peak poof. So fairly contemporary with this red threaded 1870 to 1890 corset pattern. When it comes down to it, it's a matter of silhouette. For a lady with at least six kids, Isabella's got quite the figure and it's neatly tucked away inside a late Victorian, early Edwardian corset. Um, there's no droop and swoop here. I'm around the same age and I don't have children and I'm generally a hot mess. Maybe the corset will help. It certainly can't hurt to try. The other thing is, I generally find corsets more comfortable than modern bust support. It's been a while since I wore one regularly, but if this corset turns out well, I may just switch. If you're not a plus size person, or let's just be honest, severely top heavy or morbidly obese, then you probably have no basis of comparison when it comes to the amount of discomfort and expense endured by someone who isn't a normal size. And I'm not saying that normal sized people don't have fit issues. The modern silhouette and its minimal lycra based support garments leave a lot to be desired by everyone. But it feels to me like women's underwear has become more complicated than it needs to be. It's like you need degrees in engineering and architecture to design anything over a 32B. If you don't fit standard sizing, your prices go up exponentially as availability dwindles. I, I had a soapbox around here. Uh, where did I put it? This bra cost over $200. It's a 40G if I'm not mistaken. For comparison, I'm currently an H, which really isn't all that much larger in the cup, depending on the manufacturer. I want to be honest about this because popular media has normalized a B cup and turned a D into the stuff of young men's dreams. And nothing else apparently exists beyond that all-important double D. Here's the scoop. It's all about the ratio of your underbust to your full chest. So someone who is thin but top heavy could be an H and an ill-fitting D just because that's what the lady with the tape measure told her at the department store. Similarly, the barrel-chested chubby girl could be a B. But you wouldn't know it because the only sizes available in size 46 at her local plus size store are D and double D. And let's face it, most retailers these days operate on a business model where the sale is more important than how the product fits the customer. Note that I'm saying most. I've been to specialty bra stores where they pride themselves on making sure you get the right fit and size. It, just be forewarned that you might have someone's hands all over your rack for the better part of an hour while they 
try to figure out which brand ideally fits your breast shape because jubblies come in all shapes and sizes and many are mismatched pairs. But in almost every other retail store, I've had salespeople tell me the bra just needed to be broken in or that I probably just needed to adjust the straps or maybe use an extender. Maybe an extender would help because they had a size up and a size down, but my underbust circumference suddenly became rarer than a plus size heroine in a period drama. All underwear sales are final, by the way. No returns when you get home and realize you got scammed. Bye bye $68 plus tax. And we grow up with a sense of shame about our chests, that it's a moral failing if we don't fit the literally narrow acceptable size range. If she's naturally slender, then she obviously has an eating disorder and needs to eat a sandwich. If she's overweight, she's obviously a lazy hedonistic eater who needs to go on a strict diet and exercise to extremes. When you consider that our melons tend to grow with their own agenda based on body weight and DNA, it's a pretty messed up view that to have good support and pretty underwear, we need to diet and exercise ourselves almost literally to death. I mean, seriously, if it was so easy that all I had to do was just one thing, don't you think I would have done it years ago? If it was just a matter of drinking water instead of diet soda, I'd have been on that trip in a heartbeat. That just one thing is basically change everything. I've come close a few times, I may finally succeed. Even at my healthiest, I'll probably still be plus sized with a spectacular set of hooters. I'm fine with that. If you have a problem with it, maybe you need to do a little self-exploration of your own. Do you know how much money the weight loss industry makes each year? It's literally a cash cow that depends on stigmatizing anybody, any gender, that doesn't fit a very small, hard to maintain set of parameters. In fact, the brainwashing is to the point where you can be perfectly healthy and an average weight, and they can still sell you their wares as prevention. I mean, eat healthy, that's a no-brainer, but I'm not going to shame you if things are going so poorly for you right now that you really need that Ben and Jerry's breakfast. Just remember that protein is good too. Have a vegetable once in a while, it fights scurvy. But to get back to the subject at hand, for the extra money we have to pay for larger sized brassieres, mostly as a morality tax rather than an increase in material cost, we get the short end of the stick when it comes to fashion. I absolutely hate the lingerie section of most stores because the cute and colorful affordable stuff they put up front is not for me. It's often even difficult to find a black bra for under a sheer shirt. They want me in white or beige bras that are plain and built so that they could survive a nuclear blast. That's all it's surviving nuclear war guys, cockroaches, and a beige size 42H brassiere. The bra probably saved the roach. If I'm paying upwards of 60 bucks for a department store bra because it's not made of two triangles and a couple of twist ties, I expect more than plain solid color lycra and cheaply stitched mesh. I want a bra that doesn't pop at stitching after a week. I expect lace and not the scratchy polyester stuff. I want ribbon that doesn't shred in the wash. I want fabric with polka dots and floral prints and stripes. I have some real estate to show off here, folks. Let me put a pretty gazebo on my huge tracks of land. Not just a tool shed, if you get my point. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. So I'm on the hunt for the perfect corset. They're functional, they generally smooth out the silhouette to something a little more shapely, and they can be as plain or as daring as I want to make them. They're also less expensive than you'd think, at least if you make it yourself and you don't go to absurd lengths on expensive materials. Right, I was making a corset. Roll footage. Mum set me loose on her fabric stash, so I did a bit of cash-free shopping. I may have come away with an entire Rubbermaid bin's worth of goodies, including a full metric schwack of denim. So at least I don't need to worry about not having enough twill to make a mock-up. My pattern pieces are all cut out, so it's time to place and cut the layers. The fabric for this venture is all out of remnants. 
I'm working on the last of my white twill from the early 2000s. The pink is leftover scrap from a skirt my mum made me back in the 1980s or 90s. Like many clothes from that era, I have no idea what became of it. I think the blue lining came from my mother-in-law, but I'm not sure. It might have been Mum's. I found it in storage a few months ago. Here's the fun bit. I chose a pink fabric, but had no pink thread. I was considering using either white thread or lavender, which is absolutely reasonable, but then remembered that I got the fabric from my mother, who might actually have pink thread. She had pink thread. Crisis averted. The pattern specifies to put in the standalone boning channels, so I pinned down my casings and stitched them into place. I have two widths of casings. I think quarter inch and three quarter inch, but don't quote me. In retrospect, I probably should have overlapped the two narrow casings for side-by-side -side boning channels. Instead, I ran stitches down the center of the larger casing and then sewed down the sides, making two channels from one casing. While the first option may have had a bit more bulk, it would have allowed a little more room to slide in the spiral steel bones later. With that out of the way, it's on to placing the busk. This looks like a weird stop and start hitch, but I'm stitching the spaces between the hooks so they'll poke out where the pieces are turned right side out. Confession time, I'm not using the pattern exactly as written. It builds modesty panels into the construction, and even though I'm sure the instructions were very clear, I couldn't figure them out. So I totally ignored them and used the pattern pieces without the extra panels. It's okay, it works just fine. See, with corsets I have a vague idea of what I'm doing. I placed the two front pieces together and used the hooks to mark where to make my holes for the pins on the other side of the busk. Then I used an awl or two to gently ease the fabric aside with minimal tearing. The fabric will generally settle back into place around the pins. Then I ran a line of stitches alongside the busk to secure it into place. A zipper foot really comes in handy here. Then I got to work stitching the sections together. I used the welt seam method so all the raw edges would be very tidily turned inside. The pattern has you make boning channels at the seams, so I added some extra lines of stitching. I forgot to add a waste tape, but that can always be added on later. This is going far too smoothly. Here's where I make my first real mistake. The back lacing panel is intended to be folded in half, pressed and bound, then channel stitched and grommets installed. I saw the fold line and thought Red Threaded had built a little lining overlap for finishing the back edge, similar to the way I finished the Edwardian corset. This is not the case. When I realized my mistake, I salvaged what I could of the back panel and soldiered on, getting to the point where I installed grommets and attempted to find a smooth solution to the last seam. The corset is meant to be adjustable, which is something I found out after I'd started assembly. The idea is to treat the back lacing panels as removable lacing strips, so the raw edges that would be seamed should be bound with bias tape like the other outer edges of the corset. And not only do I not have enough bias tape for that, but I've already cheesed the size of this corset by skimping on my seam allowance. If I need a smaller corset, I'll probably just disassemble the whole thing and reuse the hardware. So I spent a while figuring out ways to finish that back seam and lining until I realized the lacing panels are quite a bit shorter than the rest of the corset. I also ran out of thread because I didn't have enough going on. 
Off to my goals. Time to try and match some thread and have a think while I'm at it. I decided to recut the back panels and install them much like I did on the Edwardian corset. There's only one drawback to this. The fabric for this venture is all out of remnants. I lengthened the visible back piece with the help of some fusible interfacing. I chose this cute floral for the interior as I'm really the only one who will know it's there. I didn't add the twill core, just a bit more fusible for strength around the grommets. The interior back piece is like a flap that extends over the lining, is folded under and neatly top stitched in place where I need a boning channel. Then I installed the grommets. We are going to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is these uneven edges. This one is my fault, kind of. It can be trimmed off, that's no big deal. But, we go along here, that's lining up A-OK, -okay. that's lining up A-OK, -okay, which is quite nice. That's a little off, but nothing too shabby. So when we get towards the front, <laughs> And we've got this kind of sawtooth action going on that I'm really wondering what the heckity heck heck we're going to be doing here because the only thing I can think of would be to just come in through here and just whoop, clean that up. But I don't know whether that's going to actually allow me to use the boning that they have because that's not the only place that's uneven. We've got our bust piece here. I'm not sure if a, a couple of these pieces were inserted and they just weren't graded as well as they could have been for larger figure. As you can see here, uh, that's also jagged. Come over in here, we're jagged. And then we smooth on out until the very end. So I'm hoping that I don't have to cut down any of my spiral steel. If I do, it's not the end of the world. I do have more caps. And I do have some more spiral steel, just in case, from a previous corset endeavor years ago. So thank goodness for keeping all my old stuff. I have a package and a half of the burgundy bias tape that I bought back in the early 2000s. It should be enough to bind the top and bottom edges. This is why I chose to make the back panels permanent rather than adjustable. This is the state of the corset this morning. I've cut two more spiral steel pieces because after all was said and done, this is where I was missing one. I've replaced the spring steel at the back with slightly wider spring steel that I had from a previous project. I have also put a spring steel bone in here because Spiral steel is, is very bendy, and I am exceptionally squishy. And as a result, I didn't want it to buckle too much on the side seam. I'm hoping that the double spiral steel here will keep it from buckling, but I'm hoping that this will help as well. So we'll see how this works out. I'm probably going to have to unpick the bias up here, even though I only went in about a quarter of an inch, I am going to need all the real estate I can get because even though I cut the pattern at the right size and I ordered the, the bones to be a certain size, I'm winding up with very little spare space on either side of the bones, so I'm going to have to adjust for that. I didn't need to remove the binding. 
I did a little judicious stitch removal around the casing and readjusted the bone, hand stitching at both ends with some strong tacking stitches. I inserted the other bones and pared down the worst offender from the jagged front seams, trimmed the fabric, and stitched down the first edge of the bottom bias strip. Now for a little relaxing hand sewing whilst watching a show. Using leftover fabric was a risk, but for a first attempt trying a new pattern, I was really lucky. Some of the pattern pieces seem a bit higgledy-piggledy. I wondered if the stuff I had to trim was due to my minimal seam allowance, but I don't think so. Also, the back lacing strips being a good half inch to an inch shorter than the next panel over is a little weird. That's definitely not due to any sewing modifications on my part. You may have noticed that the corset is actually a bit big for me. It's mostly apparent in the chest, but that's mainly because I'm carrying a lot of weight at my midsection and badonkadonk. This is entirely my fault for skipping the seam allowance and I can probably fix it. The suggested boning lengths seem to be a bit off, either from the directions or what I ordered, or I should have added some extra allowance at the top edges of the corset pieces. It's a good thing I had some spare spiral steel from earlier this century, plus some spring steel leftovers from a previous project. Also, it's a good thing I have the tools to make those adjustments. I was lucky I didn't need to cut down the spring steel at the side seam. That might have required the Dremel and a trip to Home Despot for the Plasti Dip. When all is said and done, it's a good start. I now know the pattern well enough that I could probably remake it possibly as specified in the instructions, using the same hardware and have it come out a bit better. For now though, I think I'll rip this back and reseam. Uh, there's some buckling in the larger panels in the back, and I think a little bit more boning, possibly something firm like spring steel or cable ties will help do the trick. The spiral steel is just a little bendy, which is great for over the bust, but not great for corralling back fat. Obviously, Red Threaded has this pattern down to an art for their retail business, but it's possible possible that some things slipped through the cracks for the DIY pattern, which would explain the edges being so wonky. I even had some issues matching things up when comparing the cutout pattern pieces, so could just be a scaling issue in whichever program they're exporting the pattern from, you know, Illustrator or what have you. If I can salvage the corset, I want to pretty it up with some flossing. That's the main reason I stuck with a solid color rather than dipping into my limited brocade stores. If you want to be the first to know when that happens and you aren't already subscribed, you might want to do that. If you are subscribed already, the handy dandy bell icon allows you to choose to be notified when I upload. Chances are pretty good that next time I try a new pattern, I'll print it out, order a busk, and use industrial cable ties and some of my leftover spiral steel boning, then order any extra hardware I may need according to the size of the temporary materials. I've been pretty lucky so far, mistakes can be expensive. As always, I'd love to hear from you, so light up the comments and use those other buttons. Obviously, I adore seeing a thumbs up, so go ahead, make my day. I mean, you could downvote the video, but all that's really going to do is make me roll my eyes and ask myself, who would dislike a video like this? It's got 
multiple fabric cutting and stiffening options and a rant about bras. I mean, who doesn't like that sort of thing, right? I'm thinking of finding an hour or two each week to stream live sock knitting. So if that's something you'd enjoy, let me know because I'd like to get my dad's socks finished from this past year and maybe get a jump on next year because apparently his feet kept growing and I'm not making size 13s anymore. He's a size 14. I love sock knitting, don't get me wrong, but when the foot is actually a foot long, that's a lot of stockinette, know what I mean?